Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to the understanding of thy gospel teachings, and plant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments that tranquilly down all carnal desires. We may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well-pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies of Christ our God. And unto thee we ascribe glory together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and thine all holy, good, and life-giving spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Hi. everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, hi. hi. And uh, we're going to continue our discussion on topic for this year. <clears throat> Christ's um, question to his disciples and to us, who do I, who do you say that I am? And again, we're using the book by Metropolitan Valerian. Uh, the first volume of a six-volume series, actually, uh, Jesus Christ, His Life and Teaching. And so we're trying to get a picture of Jesus Christ, uh, how he lived, what he taught. And <clears throat> obviously, the first volume is the beginning of the gospel. The last several sessions, we talked about the four gospels themselves, and today, uh, he addresses the letters of St. Paul and how these also give a picture of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, the epistles include more than the letters of St. Paul, but St. Paul makes up uh, uh, the largest portion of those epistles. Now, Paul was a very different type of disciple of Christ. He was actually known as Saul prior to becoming a Christian. And um, we probably all know the story of his conversion to Christianity. Uh, the Apostle Paul stands out among the disciples of Christ. He was not a follower of Jesus during his Jesus' lifetime. And in fact, in the first years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Saul, as he was known, was an active persecutor of the Church of Jesus Christ. And in fact, during the martyrdom of St. Stephen, uh, Saul was present. And in fact, the uh, Acts of the Apostles tell us that those who stoned Stephen laid their garments at the feet of Saul while they um, martyred Stephen. Saul had a miraculous conversion to Christianity, which is... Um, narrated to us in the book of Acts, which changed his life completely. As we know, he received his baptism and immediately joined the cause of preaching the gospel. And I want to just go through some of that narrative because it is um, interesting and also kind of gives us an insight into Saul and Paul's conversion. And so Acts tells us that Saul still breathing threats and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, and this is after Stephen was martyred, went to the high priest in Jerusalem, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, giving permission that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, as they called Christians at that time, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he wants to do to them what they did to Stephen. And by the way, it was called the way at that time because Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so those disciples were uh, called members of the way until uh, later, as we see in the book of Acts in Antioch, they were first called Christians. So as Saul was on his journey to Damascus, a light shone from heaven suddenly uh, shown around him, and he was thrown from his horse, uh, fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, 
Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? <clears throat> Saul asked, who are you, Lord? He, knew, he knows that a divine voice is talking to him. And the Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now arise, go into the city of Damascus, and there you'll be told what you must do. And we see in the icon here, he's uh, not traveling alone. He has uh, people with him. The men who were traveling with Saul stood speechless, hearing the sound and seeing no one. So they all hear the voice of the Lord, uh, but they don't see him. Saul got up from the ground. And when his eyes were open, he could not see anyone. He's, so he's blinded. His fellow travelers had to lead him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And we're talking about the conversion of Saul and Paul on the road to Damascus. And so Saul was without sight for three days. And he neither ate nor drank anything at that time. I thought it was interesting that the three-day period here is again sort of introduced into the narrative. And the fast, I never heard of the fast. For three days, he didn't eat. He didn't eat or drink, that's correct. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. There's a disciple, um, <clears throat> baptized disciple in Damascus <clears throat> named Ananias. And so in Damascus, the Lord said to Ananias, arise, go to the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judah for someone named Saul, a man of Tarsus. And no, I want to interject here also, the street called Straight is where the current patriarch of Antioch resides, and that is his, his uh, headquarters there. So as we see the Antiochian patriarchates, the Sea of Antioch goes right back to literally the, the first days of Christianity. Now Ananias has heard about Saul and he's very skeptical and he says to the Lord, uh, I'm not going near this guy. I mean, he's been killing Christians for, you know, since, he's, uh, since we've been around. And the Lord says to him, for behold, he is praying, that is Saul. And in a vision, he has seen a man, you, Ananias, coming and laying his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. So Ananias is reassured by the Lord. No, you do this for me. And he says, actually, um, I plan to send this man to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. And so we know that uh, the rest of the story, Paul is taken to Ananias. He uh, baptizes him. Uh, he's uh, anointed with the Holy Spirit, the laying on of hands. And Saul goes on. Paul, now he's called Paul, uh, goes on to be a great apostle. Now, at first, the other apostles also treated Paul with distr distrust, because obviously they've all heard that about him and his past history. However, in time, they accepted him into their ranks. Nevertheless, Paul had to prove constantly that he belonged to the apostolic community. And so, in fact, he even writes to the church in the Corinthians, and he says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? And again, he's seen him in this vision of the road to Damascus. Yeah, and if I'm not an apostle unto others, I am unto you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So again, uh, Paul is invoking the right to be an apostle, even though there may be some that doubt him. Now, Paul saw his mission primarily in preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, Peter, as we know, was the apostle to the uh, Jewish Christians who first became Christians in Jerusalem and then in the surrounding areas. Uh, and then uh, Matthew, we know, wrote the gospel uh, for the Hebrew church. Uh, but Paul was mainly uh, meant to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish Christians. Although in places like Damascus and Antioch and other places, there were uh, groups of Jews who gathered in synagogues and they also were preached 
the gospel by Paul as well. But most of the other early apostles did not <laughs> preach to the Gentiles. And yet Paul emphasized that he had been called by God himself to the cause of preaching to the Gentiles, that he didn't do this at the instruction of the other apostles, but by direct order from God himself. And then Paul himself says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, what it means here is that he had me uh, picked out for this mission even while I was still in my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither did I go up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So after his conversion, baptism, and uh, <clears throat> commission, uh, he went uh, into Arabia, and uh, I would, they don't discuss what he did there, but I think the Lord was teaching him there <clears throat> by himself, uh, more revealing to himself, to him, uh, Paul, uh, his revelation of himself. He returns to Damascus, and then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, stayed with him for 15 days. I didn't see any of the other apostles except James, the brother of the Lord. So what this is telling us is that Paul uh, received his discipleship directly from the Lord apart from the other apostles. By the way, this icon is kind, is kind of the icon of the Church of Antioch. Because at one point, both Peter and Paul were in Antioch, and they were establishing the church there. And so that's why we see them holding up this uh, church in their hands. Uh, they were the original uh, founders of the church of Antioch. So, Joe, I have a question. I mean, you said Paul was not, he was not the final, the, the final supper, right? No. No. So how many, how many apostles were doing what they were doing when Paul was around that were at the final supper then? Uh, all of the, well, let's see, the 11. Uh, Judas, of course, was gone, but he was at the last supper, but he was gone after that. So the other 11 apostles, plus Matthias, who replaced Judas. So again, 12 uh, were out preaching the gospel. So now there's 13? And now there's 13. Paul is the 13th, actually. Now, just as an aside, in our iconostas, you have the apostles from the top row. Paul is there, but Matthias is not. I don't know why, but Paul is considered with the 12 in, in, uh, in, when, we, when we do the iconostas. And when you see pictures of the uh, Pentecost, it's Paul there with them. Now, I think Paul is there because he kind of represents all of the other apostles in the church who weren't at the, the upper room at the time of Pentecost. So Paul, I think, represents all Christians who now receive the Holy Spirit when we're baptized and when we're chrismated. I think, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Uh -huh, I think when I was um, younger, you know, we knew the 12 apostles and so on, and then the substitution out. But um, I, we just identified them as the apostles, and everyone else was identified as disciples. But Paul seemed to have given himself that almost equal status of the apostle, but he had never met. Um, Jesus. True. Except, yes, uh, except on the road to Damascus. Well, right. I mean, before no, his death. That's correct. Before Jesus' crucifixion. That's correct. Him, yeah. As far as we know, he did not. Right. Now, he probably knew of him. Sure. Obviously. And he was in Jerusalem uh, during the, of the uh, stoning of Peter. I mean, uh, Stephen. But, but uh, Paul is from Tarsus. So I'm not sure when he got to Jerusalem to start persecuting the church. Probably I was going to ask you. Yeah. And I'm maybe pulling this from the, the wrong context, but the role of the 70, those that were very close and 
about the time of mm -hmm. Paul, mm -hmm. but what was their role? And they didn't really get a title per se, did they? They were just well, they were apostles also, and that's a good point, Dave. Uh, what we know we call the twelve. They were the ones who were anointed by Christ. Uh, he breathed on them, gave them the Holy Spirit. This was after his resurrection. And they were the ones who then established churches, uh, anointed bishops to follow them afterwards. And the 70, though, were also apostles in that they preached the gospel as well. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point. They were, they're were they still called apostles, but separate from the 12 uh, chosen by Christ. It, but concurrently, they yes. So we, we do get a multiplier effect of eighty some, well, roughly right in that first decade or two. Oh, and they're in the church calendar, so they're commemorated. If you read the church calendar on a daily basis, you will see every now and then uh, names of the seventy, and so we we commemorate them as well. And again, they're called apostles. And even there are people in the church. Who are called equal to the apostles. Mary Magdalene is one. Uh, Helen, uh, the mother of uh, Constantine, is one. So there are equal to the apostles throughout the history of the church as well. So they, those 70 that they were talking about, they were all men? Uh, they were all men, correct, of course. But by the same token, contemporary with them were people like Mary Magdalene, who even went to Rome and evangelized the emperor, if you can believe that or not. And she had the courage even to go to the emperor of Rome and say, you know, this is the good news, this is the gospel. So uh, men and women were evangelizing at that time, even though most of the time we see names of the masses. So the gospel is spreading, the word is spreading. Now, you mentioned the 70, I'm glad you did because St. Paul describes the life of an apostle. And we oftentimes think that, you know, these are great men and women, and yes, they are. But here's how St. Paul describes it. Brethren, God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. So can you imagine, this is, this is the life of the apostles. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are ill clad and buffeted. We are homeless and we labor working with our own hands. We, when reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become and are now as the refuse of the world, as the offscouring of things. So, unlike having an exalted position, they are reviled and offscouring. You know, when you scour a pan and the grit that comes off, that's what Paul is describing the life of an apostle. He goes on to say, I do not write this to make you shamed. But to admonish you as my beloved children, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. <clears throat> for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then to be imitators of me. And he writes this to the church in Corinth. And this, by the way, this uh, epistle is read every time we commemorate an apostle in the uh, church calendar. So this is read numerous times uh, when some of the 12 are remembered and also some of the 70. So I just find it interesting that St. Paul describes the life of an apostle as one of really hard work, rejection, um, many of these negative things. However, what does he say at the very end? The imitators of me. And who does he imitate? He Im imitates Christ. So. For all Christians, really, to live a life of, uh, in Christ is to live a life of persecution, uh, eventually, somewhere along the line. And if it's not from people, you may be persecuted from demons, by temptations, by temptation to sin, by things that are put in your path, 
to keep you away from Christ. So just understand that all of us, in a way, are called to live an apostolic life. Any questions, comments, things like that? So it's very interesting what, what we're talking about as far as apostolic ministry. And I think also the other thing is we're called to be apostles, not so much to go out and preach on a street corner, but to live a life of Christ, to live a Christian life. And by living that life, we become apostles uh, to other people in, in our way of life. They see a Christian way of life and they become attracted to it. And as you were just uh, relating about uh, with the person that came, you know, they'll come to Christ somewhere along the line. They'll come to the church, either through the internet or through people that they uh, come in contact with, and they will see the kind of life we're living. So we want to try to live an apostolic life in order to be an example for those who are seeking. Now, Paul is also known as the author of Christian theology. Paul, alongside the Apostle John, is often called the author of Christian theology. As we talked about before, John was known as the theologian because he took the life of Christ and he applied theological principles to the things that Jesus taught. And Paul did the same thing. So if the synoptic evangelists, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are concerned primarily with the description of what they saw and heard, and John, who was familiar with these descriptions, he concentrates on theological ideas that issue from them, then Paul sets himself at a different task. Paul knows all this. He's read these Gospels. And he was not a participant in the Gospel story, as we said, but he interprets this story and creates the theological basis upon which the church is teaching about Jesus and God incarnate is constructed for all the subsequent generations. So Paul takes the teachings of Christ and then he applies them to the Christian life. And when you read his epistles, he says to his to the people he's ready to, this is what Jesus taught, now do this, live this way. And this is what he means, Jesus meant when he said, love your neighbor, love uh, God, uh, etc." Okay, So Paul ends up becoming a theologian in and of his own uh, right. Now, he was extremely uh, significant in the development of Christian theology. The early church recognized his role uh, in the formation of the Christian doctrine, and, in, and they even compared Paul to Christ himself in his significance uh, to the church as far as spreading the word. Even John Chrysostom claimed that through Paul, Christ said more to people than Jesus himself could have said during his uh, ministry. So Paul was a multiplier, if you will, of uh, and an amplifier and a magnifier of uh, Jesus Christ's teaching. And we know St. John Chrysostom took his time and wrote literally a commentary on the Gospels of Matthew, of John, and of all of Paul's ep epistles. And so uh, St. John Chrysostom is even yet another multiplier of the word. So as we said, Paul's epistles make up almost a third of the total volume of the New Testament. And actually, they're the first things that were written about Christian, um, Christianity, even before the Gospels appeared. His letters to the Galatians, to the Thessalonians, to the Corinthians precede even the Gospels, the first Gospels. The earliest epistles were actually to the Galatians written around the year A.D. 48-49, before the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem, which was in 51. It's a couple of years later. Do you know about the Apostolic uh, Jerusalem it, Council? It's not an ecumenical council. Is that correct? It's, it's different than ecumenical. Correct. Okay. It addressed the question of Judaization of Gentile Christians. There arose a controversy in the early church that said, the Jewish uh, segment said, well, if a Gentile is going to be a Christian, they have to be circumcised first, and then they have to go through the 
law of Moses, and then they have to apply, you know, a, a live by all these laws. And there was a great controversy in the church. Should these Gentiles become Jews first and then Christians? And between Peter and Paul, that Correct. controversy. Correct. And so there was a council convened in Jerusalem in the year 51, and it was presided by not Peter, not Paul, but James, the brother of the Lord, who was the first bishop of Jerusalem church. And it was decided that no, if you were a Gentile and you want to become a Christian, you can be baptized, you can be chrismated. And the only thing they said was you do not eat uh, foods uh, uh, offered to idols and uh, one or two other things, but you did not have to become circumcised. You did not have to follow the Mosaic law. Okay, So that council pretty much set the rules for what Gentile conversions needed to be included. And then most of the other epistles were dated in the 50s and 60s of the first century. Moreover, even in the cases when it would appear that Paul could have known about the events described by the eyewitnesses of Jesus, he does not refer to those eyewitnesses, but he refers rather to the revelation from God. And this is what I meant when, he's, when I said he was in Arabia for three years. I think God was revealing to him, Jesus was revealing to him what he taught his other disciples because Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Now he's talking to the Corinthians here. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and he'd given thanks. He broke it and said, take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this do in remembrance of me literally word for word almost what we say in our divine liturgy and this comes from Paul's <clears throat> epistles who did not witness the last supper and whose other apostles had not written or the gospel had not written yet right that's when he right. was writing these letters that's right so he didn't have necessarily the benefit of having read them that's right good point Susie so this is again reaffirms that God gave this revelation to him and not the other apostles. And then after the after the same manner, he also took the cup which he had when he had supped, saying, "This cup is the New Testament, New Covenant." I want to make this point clear too. This is the New Covenant. This is not the Old Covenant with uh, Abraham, with Isaac, with Moses, with David. This is the New Covenant, New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. And now this is Paul talking, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So Paul receiving the revelation from Jesus and now telling his uh, disciples, if you will, uh, those teachings to the, uh, to the church. Yeah. And it says he do show the Lord's death until he come. Is, you remember, mean, you remember the Lord's death. It's, it's for us, it's in order to go into somebody else. For us, yeah. And, and don't forget, you're talking to the church community, so you're in this community, you're, you're partaking of the Eucharist, and so you're remembering the same thing that the Lord did on the last supper. So we're talking about the epistles of Paul and how they have uh, spread throughout the church along with the four Gospels. Now, at the same time, even though Paul was uh, came after them, he emphasizes his complete oneness of mind with the other apostles. So they are all of one mind, one heart, as we say in our divine liturgy. The gospel that he preaches is the gospel of Christ, identical to the one preached by the other apostles. In fact, Paul says, therefore, whether it was I or they, speak to you, he's talking to the Corinthians, so we preach, so ye believe. So we all preach the same thing, we all teach the same thing, we all believe the same thing, whether I did it, whether Peter did, Mark, uh, Lou, John, anyone else, we all preach the same thing. Now, unfortunately, some biblical scholars, and particularly in the last couple of centuries, Paul has become an object of criticism from their perspective 
Uh, Paul transformed the man Jesus into the son of God. He created God incarnate out of a simple Galilean carpenter. Now, this, and this, I've heard this from other um, uh, critics of Christianity who said, oh, Jesus never said he was son of God. This was all Paul's construction. Paul created Christianity. Uh, you know, this is all a, a man-made religion. Has anyone else heard this? Part of the history behind that was is in the 1800s in Germany, they wanted to attack Christianity and they realized they couldn't attack Jesus himself because that would be, he would just blow, people would blow up. Okay. So what they did is they picked Paul because Paul was savior. So they figured they did attack Paul and then worked their way up to Jesus and eventually he started getting like uh, Swipes his life of, of Christ and life of, you know, his historical Jesus started coming out. But first they had to attack Paul because it was easier to do. Thank you, Tony. That's that's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, it was intentionally, they put the the answer first, that, that Christ isn't God. And then they went back and they tried to find the proof for it. Right, exactly. And so this was, as, as you said, it was the uh, last couple of centuries that this uh, came up. But, and again, our source here, Metropolitan Hilarion, says, but upon closer unbiased examination, we found a profound inner unity between Paul, what he says about Jesus, and what the four gospel writers say about him as well. So those criticisms fall apart upon a really close uh, unbiased examination. In spite of the differences in emphases and audience, the image of Jesus in the writings of the evangelists and Paul are not torn asunder. They are not separated. In fact, it's the totality of the New Testament writings that give the most complete picture of Jesus as a person and as and his life and teaching. So Paul complements the Gospels rather than separate from them. So had Paul's teachings been at radical variance with the teachings of the other apostles, they would have driven him out, just like they did some of the early heretics who tried to feed off the image of Jesus. One of them that comes to mind is Simon the Magician, Simon Majus. He wanted to latch on to the gospel teachings, and he wanted to literally buy the Holy Spirit, buy the, the, the grace of the Holy Spirit. Well, he was cast out because uh, he was a he was a heretic. So um, those are the type of people who were heretics who were not uh, part of the the uh, apostolic teaching. And by the way, Simon the magician, Simon the Jews, is they say the father of the Gnostics, the Gnostic teaching, which came later, which hopefully we'll talk about here shortly, uh, uh, as heretical teachings. Where, where is he in the Bible? Simon. The book of Acts. You read the book of Acts. Uh, he is a, a Paul, or Peter confronts him. He comes to Peter and he says, you know, I like what you guys are doing. Um, I want to be part of it. And then he, uh, he says, in fact, I'll, I'll pay for the grace of the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, name your price and I'll, I'll pay it. And Peter says, you know, you're, you're on the wrong track. I'll get out. So nothing of the sort happened with Paul. In spite of the initial distrust, the apostles quickly got used to the idea that there had been appeared among them one who had been called to the apostolic ministry later than them, but was destined to labor more greatly than all of them in preaching the gospel. And in fact, Paul himself says, indeed, I'm the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, as we know. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace, which was bestowed on me, was not in vain, but I worked more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Note his humility. He's, yes, I worked harder than everyone else, but it was God working in me, his grace, that actually did it. So uh, Paul, even though he does uh, preach the gospel uh, with all of his heart, it's God that he gives the credit to. 
So in summary, the value of Paul's epistles for a reconstruction of the image of Jesus is determined by the fact that although they are not in full measure a primary source, in other words, he's not a high witness uh, of the life of Christ, nevertheless, his epistles are, they present a very rich material to understand how this information was refracted or seen in the minds of the first generations of Christians. Charlie, Charlie I, the Luke's name keeps popping up on my head as you know as a gospel writer, but not as a disciple or apostle uh, or disciple. Um, was he ever given the level of skepticism and uh, discrimination, discernment that Paul was? Uh, no, he wasn't. And be interesting you mentioned that, uh, David, because Paul is, I mean, uh, Luke is considered, along with Mark, one of the 70. Uh, yeah, right. And yeah. so he was given credibility. Uh, not only that, but uh, they also, uh, church holds tradition that Luke may have been one of the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus mm -hmm. who uh, met the Lord after the resurrection. So as far as I know, Luke was not given any kind of skepticism then. As far as we know, he, he was like literally from almost day one in step with them. He was there. He didn't hear a third hand, second Correct. hand. It was so that's yeah. interesting. Yeah, and Luke was also a very close follower of Paul, ironically. Oh, interesting. And so a little uh, credibility there being a yeah. doctor and a right. gospel writer. Exactly. And so Luke, uh, Luke was one of the last to stay with Paul right to the end, right in Rome before he was martyred. So the Gospels themselves contain not only information on the life and words of Jesus, but also their interpretation, especially the Gospel of John. Paul's epistles give a quite, uh, give a quite full picture of how Jesus' mission was viewed only 20 or 30 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. So what Paul does is, here's the life of Christ. The Gospels are telling, told us, here's how he lived. This is what he taught. And now 20 to 30 years later, Paul shows us how this is uh, looked at by the world uh, Christian community uh, within that Mediterranean sphere. Here's an eye kind of, kind of a summary of Paul's uh, preaching. This is uh, St. John Chrysostom writing his commentaries. That's St. Paul behind him. This is a tradition in the church that Paul almost supernaturally was telling St. John Chrysostom, this is what I meant when I wrote this passage in this epistle. And so St. Chrysostom is writing his commentaries. As I said, he wrote many commentaries. And what it's saying here in this flowing out is Paul has shown us what man really, what great man, uh, how great man really is. In other words, Paul is speaking to Chrysostom, who writes his commentaries. He preaches. He was a great preacher, obviously, golden mouth. And now the rest of the church is receiving this wisdom as we see in this uh, the father fathers of the church uh, passing that on throughout the rest of the world. So just kind of a commentary, a little in iconographic form of uh, Paul's influence in the church and how it goes on through the other fathers of the church. Questions, anything else, commentary? In the last few minutes that we have here, I'm gonna talk about how did they put together what we know is the New Testament or the canon of the New Testament. And just, you know, uh, the highlights here. Assembling this New Testament canon was a process that lasted for more than three centuries. So it took about 300 years. These all didn't just come together in the, you know, 20 or 30 years after Christ's uh, resurrection. The result of this process was that out of a great variety of literature devoted to Jesus and his teaching, by the end of the fourth century, the church had selected those books that we call the New Testament, and they put them together uh, in a single, quote, book, but obviously many books. 
At the same time, the four Gospels had, in fact, already been canonized by the Church around the second century, around the, the early 100s, 200s. So the four Gospels, they, they're for sure. And this is testified by St. Irenaeus of Lyon, which is uh, early uh, second century, he says, since there are four zones in the world, north, south, east, and west, four principal winds, uh, while the church is scattered throughout the world, and the pillar and ground of the church is the gospel and the spirit of life, it's fitting that the church should have four pillars, that is the four gospels, breathing out immortality on every side and vivifying or bringing life to people afresh. From which fact it's evident that the word, that is Lord Jesus Christ, the artificer or uh, uh, creator of all, he that sits on the cherubim contains all things, who was manifested to men has given us the gospel under four aspects, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, bound together by one spirit. So in poetic form, he's basically telling us, this is the life of Jesus. This is the manifestation of him in these four gospels. This was all done in response to heresies, as we were talking about Simon the Magician and others. The need to select, select the gospels and give them canonical status was determined because a lot of unchristian literature was coming out at that time. And, and they under, undermined the authority of the Gospels. And for instance, the Gnostic Marcion, he said, well, only the Gospel of Luke is good. Everything else is not correct. Another heretic, Montanus, uh, said only the Gospel of John is the one we should be reading. Everything else is good. And so what this created doubt in people's minds about, well, is this really correct? Is this not correct? What am I supposed to read? One thing we have to know, the Gnostic systems had Christian elements. They mixed a little bit of Christianity with things from Eastern religions, occultism, magic, and astrology. And so you got all this other junk coming in along with some Christian teaching. Folks. And so with that, uh, it's in the context of this type of thing that the canon of the New Testament was put together. Uh, and so that became the custom of the church. The church itself, we have to remember that the church created the scriptures and put the scriptures together, not the other way around. It's not sola scriptura. The church existed first, and then the scriptures were put together. That's a big difference. That's something we have to understand as Orthodox Christians, an Orthodox mentality. It's not the Bible only, and then everything else comes from that the other way around. So by the third century, both the East and the West had decided four Gospels, those are the ones we consider canonical. And then one of the early church Christian uh, writers, Origen, he divided it, there's four Gospels, and then there's the writing of the Apostles, put them together, that's the New Testament. And so we approve of nothing but what the church approves of itself. So in the early church, there were many compositions. They became known as apocryphal writings. Some were condemned by the church and destroyed because of their Gnostic origin, as we talked about just a little bit ago, because they contained things that had nothing to do with Christianity. So the person of Jesus uh, was really not central in any of the Gnostic system. They just brought a few Christian elements, and then they had what they call fantastic phantom adorable uh, writings, things that are just constructions out of their, out of their crazed imagination. <laughs> so the Gnostics were dissatisfied with the church gospels. They created their own uh, alternative versions. One of them, I just found out, was the gospel of Judas, imagine, mm -hmm. which was mentioned by Irenaeus of Lyon. Even back then, he heard of it. In it, Judas is presented as the closest disciple to Jesus, and Jesus reveals to him the mysteries of the kingdom. And then in this gospel, Jesus betrays, uh, Judas betrays Jesus at Jesus' command. So think about that. <laughs> now, anybody here old enough to remember Jesus Christ Superstar? No. 
Who was the center of that thing? Judas. Judas, exactly. Now, I'm not sure, but I would say that somewhere along the line, some of those writers may have heard of the Gospel of Judas and put this thing together. Uh, and that thing, I mean, I remember it had a massive impact on society at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in essence, it's a, it's a very heretical mm -hmm. production, but it's popular even now up to our time. There have been revivals of it. And so we have to be very careful that what we hear in popular culture is not often uh, what we want to contain. Uh, yeah. There are... There are some non-heretical apocryphal texts that we uh, know of. Uh, these were not heretical. They were not rejected by the church. Uh, in fact, they worked their way into the church's uh, tradition. Uh, one of them is called the Pro-Evangelium of, of uh, James, which talks about the birth, infancy, and youth of the Virgin Mary, and the Gospel of Nicodemus, which narrates Christ's descent into Hades. And the pro, e, proto evangelium of James formed the basis of the church's feasts of the Nativity of the Mother of God on September 8th, and coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, the feast of the entrance of the Mother of God into the temple. So when you read the church's litur liturgical um, uh, passages, uh, they come from this book. And then also, the Gospel of Nicodemus forms the basis of worship for our Great and Holy Saturday service. And so if you remember Great and Holy Saturday, we hear a lot about the death and uh, Satan uh, lamenting their overthrow. Well, that's where we get a lot of the information from the, the so-called Gospel of Nicodemus. So they're not canonical writings in and of themselves. They're not in the New Testament but they do contribute somewhat to our liturgical life and the feasts of the church. Are they considered the writings of the Holy Fathers at all, or are they separate from that? They're separate from that because they're, the, the authors are not known, uh, even though it says the yes. Gospel of Nicodemus. I don't think Nicodemus actually wrote that. The same thing with the uh, Proto Evangelium and James. There's no good evidence that he actually wrote them. However, there are elements in both of those that the church has adopted and said, yes, Christ descended into Hades. As we see here, he broke the bonds of hell. Uh, he bound the Satan and death by his resurrection. And he released those captives, as we see in the, in the uh, icons. And in the front of our church, we have this icon. And we have Adam and Eve, uh, David and uh, Solomon, uh, St. John the Baptist over here. We have the first one to die, which was Abel, and then some of the prophets of the Old Testament. And so a lot of this has worked its way into the, the church's life. Uh, the same thing with um, uh, the other uh, feasts, the, the, the nativity of uh, the Theotokos, uh, we know uh, Anna and Joachim and that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as an ex Protestant, I, I, that does kind of, your, your previous statement about, you know, the church forms the, the Bible, Bible doesn't form the church helps. So, so I guess what I'm asking is, 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 so those would be considered like not to the level of scripture but they are worth reading because they do contain truth, but it just doesn't rise to the level of scripture. That's that, that correct. What I would do a, a qualifier on that, not all that is in, contained in those two writings are necessarily what we would use uh, for the church. I would take what, what is in the church lit, liturgies from them and use that as constructive reading, but not necessarily the whole of that work. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand where they fit in. Is they're like worth reading? Yeah, but they're not 
a guide for doctrine and faith. Correct. That's a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, Nick, I mean. What kind of education uh, Paul and John Christensen had? Because I see the majority of the, all of them had great uh, oratorical skills and many tried to write the gospel, but only two gospels made it to this day. Um, actually, Paul was very well educated. He was a Pharisee, so he knew the Old Testament and the law completely very well. Uh, John, the apostle, was actually a fisherman. So he did. He was not very well educated. No, John Chrysostom oh, wrote John. the gospel and Basil the Great because we have two gospels, yeah. right? Uh, John. Yes. They were very well educated. They were educated in classical Greek uh, education and also Christian education from the fathers of the church before them. So yeah, they were very well educated. Uh, of the four gospel writers, only Luke was classically educated. He mm -hmm. he had um, a very classical Greek education, uh, and he was a physician as well, so he was very well educated. But Matthew, well, Matthew was a tax collector, so he had some education. But um, uh, Mark was <coughs> not necessarily a very well educated, and uh, uh, John, as I said, was a fisherman. But I think the the divine knowledge that they gained was more valuable than just uh, normal education. Thank you. So anything else? Any other comments, questions? All right, well, but, thanks everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for being here.